Welcome to Divorce Cafe, the podcast where we demystify, detangle, and hopefully detox the legal processes that follow a separation with the experts of the relationship property world. Today, we're talking spousal maintenance. On the home team, I'm Shelley Fennell. And I'm Tyna Henderson. We are partners in law and friends in life. We work with people going through a separation to navigate what is usually a very complex and bewildering process. So Shelley is a numbers whiz who worked in relationship property uh, law until she went through her own separation and experienced it all from the other side of the desk. Mm -hmm. uh, I love working in this area because it feels like important work um, and I want to be involved in making it better. And this podcast and the conversations that we're going to have um, is going to be hopefully be a part of that. So spousal maintenance, um, if you haven't come across it before, well, even if you have, um, it's a really important, uh, or it is really important to people who have separated and suddenly lost the family income they used to rely on. Uh, it's an area that used to be pretty bleak in terms of the cost, um, or cost of, of applying and the size of the awards, but in recent years, champions like today's guest have gone in and kicked some butt and the tide appears to be turning. Uh, judges are recognising they need to use their power uh, to influence outcomes for people going through a separation and they're actually starting to make some pretty significant awards in this uh, field. Today's guest was at the absolute top of our wish list for guest speakers and we are so excited to be here with her today. To me, she is the Captain Marvel of the Family Court uh, because of the cases that she's fought because of the seminars that she delivers so beautifully and for her collegiality and professional decency, um, including being immensely helpful to me um, on several occasions. Uh, she's fresh from running her, uh, uh, her client's appeal to the Supreme Court and she's waiting for a decision on that as we speak. Um, going to the Supreme Court is not something that many practitioners can boast of, not that she would. Viv Crawshaw is a highly experienced practitioner and a King's Counsel since 2018, which is the legal profession's version of a Jedi. The legal world knows her as a consummate professional and expert in the field of busting and defending trusts and for her significant body of work in the field of spousal maintenance, which is what we've invited her here today to talk about. Viv Crawshaw, Casey, welcome to Divorce Cafe. Thank you very much, Taina. Okay, so before we get into the meatier stuff, in our first segment we like to have our very distinguished guest pick a random question from the, from the bucket. Uh, I apologise in advance because um, half of the questions are Tyna's uh, thoughtful contemplations of like human conditions and the other half were made up by me. So Right. <laughs> okay. This is my first challenge. This is interesting. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, do you want to read it out to us? Yes. About now, thousands of law students will be celebrating or commiserating the outcome of their summer clerk interviews. Thinking about your journey to where you are now, what advice would you give to those students? Mm. Mm. Run. Well, <laughs> no, no, not at all. Um, I would suggest that they, where they are placed, is probably less important than who they are uh, placed with, really. And so, having a really good mentor that they can work with and somebody who they, who is really good at what they do, be that in litigation or commercial or whatever that might be, is really uh, important. Um, I think the big firms have got better capacity to train people mm -hmm. and training is just so important. I mean my first job, which luckily wasn't a big firm, my letters were just covered in red pen. <laughs> I remember I could barely yeah. read them, but um, you know even just letter writing yeah. is a really mm. important skill. Um, I also followed uh, the partners who I was working for around court and saw how they 
uh, appeared in court and I, mm. in my first sort of few months I was basically there lackey and carrying everything and mm. helping as much as I could and that was enormously helpful. I mean if you're going to be in litigation get into court, get yeah. a job where you can get into court. So yeah. that's what I would be saying to them. And, and um, you'll also know from talking with other people who've worked in various firms, you know, who's good to work for and who isn't, and do listen up, does make quite a difference, I think. Mm, mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think, I mean, I'm not sure whether you had a straightforward process through, you went straight into a big firm, but just because you don't get, a, you know, the summer clerking role, doesn't mean you have to give up law school. There's, oh, you know, no. And especially, especially if you can't do that, like, working in, you know, different provinces of New Zealand is amazingly... Um, helpful in terms of the broadness of experience mm. you'll get. What you're thrown um, into straight away. And some really good work there. Mm. So, you know, yeah. don't yeah. feel disappointed about that. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Mm. Okay. Uh, so, oh, here we go. So the next section is called The Basics. Um, I never like to feel silly on a podcast, so we supply people with what you need to know to um, take part in the conversation. And that is the basics. And today, we're lucky enough to have, um, Viv is gonna do a tight five, but it can be as long a five as you like. And the, um, your, uh, your goal is to summarize what spousal maintenance is and why we have it. Sure, well, I guess I can start by saying what it isn't, and it isn't child support. So mm. child support is a statutory right uh, for the um, primary caregiver, if there is one, to obtain assistance for the child from the liable parent, that's the paying parent. So it isn't um, a payment for costs associated with children. It's a payment for the spouse, but when we talk about spouses, we often think of wives or, or husbands. Um, you don't have to have been married mm. to be entitled to spousal maintenance. So uh, on the ending of a relationship, one uh, of the parties, be that the um, I'll call them the wife or husband just loosely, even though we're talking about de facto relationships too, uh, may be in a position where they just can't support themselves, even with the payment of child support. So to the extent they can't support themselves and that is related in some way to the way in which the relationship um, transpired, they're entitled to really what you might loosely call a top-up payment. Mm. So what the legislation talks about is what their reasonable needs are and what one party's reasonable needs in some circumstances might be is going to be really different from somebody who might live in, say, Remuera. Um, mm. So we've got to look at um, the comparison isn't between your average uh, Kiwi living in Aotearoa, it is the comparison is what was the standard of living during this relationship. Mm. And that's in itself a ground for maintenance to be paid in some circumstances. Mm. And do you think, is that to avoid that situation where parties come out of a relationship and one of them has a sharp drop in their standard of living and the kids are living with them some of the time and the other ones? Yeah, of... so in a classic division of functions where one party's been able to, well, been able to um, enhance their career during the relationship, and that sounds like a privilege, but it's also a burden. Mm. I mean, they, they might have to get up at 5.30 in the morning and mm. can have a long commute and then not get back till late in the evening and the, um, the spouse might get the children off to school and have a bit more leisure time mm. than the um, yeah. career-earning party. But the career-earning party then at the end of a relationship still has a career to turn to and an ability usually to be self-supporting, whereas the person who may have sacrificed their career is in... Um, a really difficult financial position. They haven't been financially independent and they're not going to suddenly become financially mm. independent. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And is it, um, is it like we hear in the American movies and it goes on forever until you can marry them off? Or um, mm -hmm. it, yeah, there's a, it's sort of intended to cover... Yes, yeah, so period, how long is it? a piece of mm. string? In the UK, you can get maintenance for life. We are not like that in New Zealand. But neither are we as parsimonious as some judges initially thought um, before the latest sort of legal mm. developments. Um, there is a stipulation that if you do enter an, a de another de facto relationship or you marry, you are no longer entitled to maintenance. So that brings an end to mm. it. 
and that's kind of this sort of slightly antediluvian idea that yeah, you've got another man to support mm, you, yeah. so, so he's, got, he's got to do it, not, not your yeah. former spouse. Uh, but in New Zealand, we, some people sort of talk of a two-year cut-off. Well, in actual fact, it's not as harsh as that. After divorce and after the ending of a de facto relationship, you are under a different section. And that section basically says, in round terms, you need to start being self-supporting. But it hasn't been interpreted in a harsh way. And there are some cases, for example, where there's like screeds of children or a disabled child where um, the divorced wife, uh, or in some cases a husband, is just simply unable to be self-supporting and mm. they're still in Quite need of spousal time. maintenance. Mm. And their relationship probably hasn't been resolved and in those cases, maintenance can run on much longer than mm. the two-year cut-off. It's mm. not a cut-off yeah. uh, as used to be considered yeah. to be the case. And the, the courts, have, well, the judges have got quite a bit of discretion, don't they, in terms of what is required for justice in the particular circumstances of this case? Mm. Uh, particularly at interim level. Right. Uh, under an interim spousal maintenance order, it's almost pure discretion. So the cases are saying that you still need to look at the underlying qualifying mm. criteria. Um, and now we know that interim orders can be rolled over. Mm. Um, it's not a complete rollover, but the court has the ability to do that without having to have to a full here. And, mm. yeah. oh, so that's what mm. you found. So not that's a, a case full. called Cooper and Pinney. Mm. Yeah. So, you, you know, the risk is with an interim order, um, it only lasts for six months. Um, so if it's wrongly made... Um, or if you're still fighting to enforce mm. the order at the end of the six months, mm. yeah, it can feel a bit harsh. So if you're someone that has facials, waxing, gets their nails done in the course of the marriage, they mm. might stay at home and mm. there's a lot of body prep, uh, do you think you're going to get that covered in spousal maintenance? Is yeah, there you can actually. You really can. Yeah. And, and, um, so if keep that's doing that stuff, is that the message? Oh, <laughs> I wouldn't be that tactical. Yeah. I, I think the thing is if you have evidence of a high rate of expenditure, and, yeah. and look, usually it's pretty even-handed. It's very rare that one spouse is spending on waxing mm -hmm. and nails and mm. hair appointments and the other spouse is sitting there um, being very frugal. Yeah. Often there'll be you know, jet skis bought and, mm. you know, yeah, really expensive cy and cycles and things like that. So um, it'll usually be pretty even-handed, but they, the couple may have been big spenders because yeah. there was mm. a big income. Yeah. And so as, as long as the applicant has got evidence of that yeah. expenditure during mm. the marriage, then that will be an item of expenditure that is usually allowed in a budget for mm. maintenance, yes. Unless the provider of the maintenance enters into another relationship with someone that's getting facials. Ah. Oh, no, oh no, 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 that we'll doesn't, dis yeah. no, no, that doesn't, that's not the disentitlement, the disentitlement mm. yeah. is to the recipient of spousal mm. maintenance. But doesn't the court take into account the fact that yeah. they have another partner that they Well, they might... take into account what the what other demands there are on that person yeah. if they're supporting someone else, but it doesn't cancel it out right. in the same way. Oh, no, it yeah. certainly doesn't obviate mm. the right. obligation to provide maintenance. You can't kind of rock up to court and say, I've got a new lady <laughs> and she's expensive. Yeah. And, and forget the, the former spouse yeah. with their three children and yeah. are struggling. That's mm. really going to go down okay. like a cup yeah. of cold soap. Yeah. 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 That's good. Okay, so um, now your this next section uh, stuff we find interesting um, is when we're going to move on to uh, something that you're of course going to talk about when you're with Viv Crawshaw, which is her um, famous case, McQueen and Penn. Um, so I think it's probably your most famous spousal maintenance case, would you say? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So it was an epic. It was a bit of a uh, Lord of the Rings um, of. <laughs> of legal cases, a series of cases, um, and it's a great one for examining the dynamics, I think, of a maintenance case, because there are a lot of things that um, appear in it that I've noticed appearing in, uh, in cases through the years. And it has a hell year ending, um, which is, well, from my perspective, and we'll hear whether it felt like that for you. So um, yeah, we wondered whether we could talk to you about that mm. today. You were acting for the wife, we're going to call I her was. the wife. Yes, um, Ms. she was a wife. Yeah, yes. I'm calling her Ms. Penn, um, mm. not her real name. No. Uh, and for our listeners who aren't uh, so familiar with it, I'm going to give you a really quick uh, 
well, not really quick, and tell you the story of McQueen and Penn's relationship. And, um, and then we'll throw back to Viv to talk to us a bit about what was happening in that case. So here are the facts that are on the public record. The parties met in 2000, uh, they married, that was in the UK, they, they married in 2006, they had two children together, and they moved to New Zealand, and in 2011 they separated. Uh, when they met, he was a plastic surgeon, quite a senior plastic surgeon, she was a nurse. Uh, she started studying to be a dentist um, partway through the relationship, but had to give that up when she had her first child. She then stayed home with the kids and was the, um, the primary caregiver, and he continued to work full time as a surgeon um, and had various segues in his uh, career. The parties had a really high standard of living, so that's the um, I don't know about waxing, um, but they had a high standard of living when they were together. Um, he had other independent sources of income, uh, uh, including a, a, a mother who had a trust um, and who was quite generous. He had um, also investment properties that returned um, some money as well. Um, it was normal for them to have expensive overseas holidays. Um, they had things like a paid dog walker uh, and generally spent more than your average couple. Um, and when they separated, the children were preschoolers, both of them, according to um, what I've seen. In 2013 is when uh, Ms. Penn applied for maintenance. Um, but, yeah, if I can hand it over to Viv, um, can you tell us what, what were the issues in, in that case? What were the things you were being well, discussed? Well, there didn't appear to be a large amount of relationship property because most of the property, which was quite substantial, was held in the UK. So the focus was on uh, ensuring that um, Ms Penn uh, received maintenance in accordance with the statutory provisions because she hadn't been, and she actually wasn't getting child support either. Um, she at one stage was on a benefit. Mm, and the judge yeah. says she was effectively hand to mouth. She I lived in, a, in very modest circumstances and there is a description in one of the judgments about the rental property that she was in being mouldy and mm -hmm. the drawers in the kitchen not opening properly and mm -hmm. she was living a very, very subsistence existence. She was almost in poverty. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and, and from he was not probably. Well he was a surgeon and yeah. he was living a, a sort of life that surgeons would lead mm -hmm. but he also did have some family money so and I guess that was perhaps to one side of the inequality between them, but the inequality that was really um, existing was driven by his very good income, even though he was only working part-time. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, and how did that litigation progress? Well, it was very hard fought. Um, I think it was probably considered a bit audacious to apply for maintenance. Mm. Uh, so there was an initial interim spousal maintenance and interim distribution order made, but he successfully appealed that to the High Court. And it was sent down, uh, remitted for reconsideration in the Family Court, but we Do you just... Do know how that happened? It's pretty insane. I have my theories. Yeah, but, okay. Um, Felt a bit unfair at the time. Um, costs were actually ordered against her, which almost mm. exceeded the amount of the award she was seeking, which was <gasps> wow. a very interesting um, outcome. Mm. So, um, so we then proceeded to the substantive hearing of the spousal maintenance, rather than muck around with interim. Mm. And so we proceeded, and by that stage we were seeking past spousal maintenance as well as future maintenance. Um, but obviously it wasn't going to go long forever and I believe it was about four years worth in the end that mm. we were seeking. Uh, so there was a hearing and cross-examination and so on and the judge roundly found in favour of the mm. applicant wife and ordered um, I think what was then and may, may not be anymore but it was then the largest award of spousal mm. maintenance um, in terms of past maintenance that had been ordered. Mm. But that was actually because he hadn't paid any um, mm -hmm. And that was really interesting, so it was quite an interesting feature of the case, whereas most maintenance cases, um, there will be some maintenance paid, it may not be sufficient to really mm. top up the reasonable needs, but there will be some maintenance mm -hmm. paid, but here uh, that hadn't taken place, mm -hmm. so yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, one, when we succeeded, 
he appealed the decision. Um, from the High Court? No, from the Family from the Court family to the court. High Court. Right. And yeah. he was successful in a very small um, margin, by a small margin, about 51,000 mm. was reduced. Um, so re re reduced to about $350,000 as a past maintenance award. Um, and then he sought leave to appeal to the Court of Appeal, uh, the High Court's judgment, but the Court of Appeal resoundingly declined leave to appeal. You don't have a right of appeal to the Court of Appeal mm. in those circumstances. And they heard argument, but declined leave. Ah, oh, that's just, uh, yeah, wow. So it was quite a, a litigation fiasco, wow. really. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, the, and the High Court judge was actually pretty critical of Mr McQueen um, mm. and the way he pursued his case. Mm. Um, just for a bit of context, um, the judge said that he he had dragged out the litigation by contesting every fact and expense, mm. Mm. which meant that hours more needed to be spent on responding to affidavits and file long mm. affidavits. And it meant, importantly, the case was so much more expensive than it might have been. Mm. Mm. There's certainly no agreement on any points. I think he contested the, um, any obligation to pay her. The judge actually said he was evasive in answering direct questions about his own income and expenses. He denied the value of Ms. Ms. Penn's contributions to the relationship and blamed her for all his problems. He sounds like mm. an absolute peach. Um, he, he, he added to that trifecta with cry, by crying poor when he was in fact appeared to be living a pretty la lavish lifestyle. I think he points out at one stage that his expenses are going to be 400000 and so his shortfall was going to be 147000 mm. so he couldn't be expected to support uh, his ex. And in saying all of that, um, it's really hard not to like create a caricature of him as an evil ex, right? Um, but how common, in your experience, is it to see this sort of approach taken? Well, not that common. So this mm. was probably, you know, well outside of the bell curve as such. And it is interesting because at that time, the inclusion of legal fees for a spouse who was seeking mm. spousal maintenance was not awarded. Um, it wasn't de rigueur to do that. Mm. That has since changed. And you've got to wonder, looking with that um, in mind, with the benefit of hindsight, whether had that been a risk to him that mm. he might have actually not just had to have paid her day-to-day -day expenses, mm. but possibly her legal costs yeah. as well, because in the end she ended up on legal aid. Um, uh. That that might have that might have been more of a threat, um, because legal costs you can you know it's not at all uncommon to for somebody to be awarded as much as yeah. five to ten thousand dollars a month. Eight or twelve thousand. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that can that can happen, and mm. you, if that had been something that was a serious threat to him, perhaps yeah. mm. he might have taken a different approach. Mm. Um, but he threw everything at the opposition mm. to it. Yeah. yeah, so you wonder, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how things change. Um, but then again, it came out with some really interesting points which have helped um, litigants who have had similar applications since. So yeah. there's some I, good I've principles that yeah. have come, have yeah. come through the, that Absolutely. decision. Well, if there's one thing that a breadwinner hates more you know, than paying their ex-spouse, it's paying their ex-spouse's lawyer, right? Yeah, that is quite a their lawyer. That's that a significant, you know. Yes, that's like eating a rat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. And yet, uh, you know, it can happen. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Is it, it easy to get the lawyer's costs now? Is it? Oh, it's much. It's much easier. It's not a given, yeah. and obviously the court has to look at a whole lot of other factors. For example, whether there's an interim distribution available, mm. um, or whether there's some other source from which they could be met. So um, when they do award the legal costs, are they? Does that cover the actual legal, legal yeah, costs in can, most cases? Yeah, can sometimes, mm. and, and sometimes the courts make a condition of an award that it must be paid to yeah. the lawyers. You can't sort right. of ask for, mm. you know, five grand a month else. for household expenses mm. and ten for legals and get fifteen a month, and then oh gosh, the lawyers don't actually get paid. Yeah. Mm. Usually, those applicants who come to court asking for legal costs mm. have got legal bills and they, they owe their already. lawyers a lot of money yeah. by yeah. that stage. And you, Obviously, the uh, you you have to present evidence of yeah. that. Yeah, mm. yeah. yeah. So um, 
you were successful in the end, you know, brilliantly successful, winning the appeal, securing your client a lump sum, which yes. allowed her to move on. Mm. Um, that's the headline outcome. But in terms of what was going on in the background, did you feel like justice was done yeah, in that very, case? Very much. Yeah, very awesome. much. So, yeah, mm. it was it was a really just outcome, and in the circumstances, it was exactly what needed to happen. Yeah. Mm. Um, so that segues nicely into uh, my next question which relates to the years of litigation that went on here so two separate maintenance hearing and then the appeals and a further appeal mm. plus the relationship property proceedings which mm. went on another four or five years or something mm. um, in the end another you got an years, amazing outcome for her but you neither of you knew that at the time right mm. and I guess maybe you had no choice but to fight it but how did she cope with that? And how did you cope with the load of that? Mm. <laughs> um, the cost Well, I mean, time. it was terribly stressful. I can't mm. obviously um, discuss her yeah. in any way because that's, that's not fair on her with mm. her permission. But I think you can speak generally and just say for any litigant, it's hugely stressful. Mm. And um, I always advise litigants who are in the middle of um, you know, court hearings and so on, to just do their best to live their lives and leave um, the litigation up to me. I'll ask when they need the help for affidavits or so on, but just Try don't don't life. even mm. think about it if you if you can if you can manage to do that. So do compartmentalise mm -hmm. the litigation and then live your life. Mm. Um, for me, it was quite a turgid case because of that first appeal against the interim maintenance, which was terrible. Yeah. And so I was really lucky, really fortunate to have um, Louise Reid come on board who mm. um, assisted me and she was magnificent mm. and that made a real difference and yeah. usually these days most of my cases I'm really fortunate to have um, either a junior barrister or an instructing solicitor assist me and that's just absolutely yeah. essential to manage, mm. yeah, to have a team mm. as much as anything. It's um, really important to be able to chew through the issues and mm. yeah. yeah it's great yeah. yeah that must have been a real something to come back mm. from because for the client it's sort of the uh, uh, it, it uh, suggests that what the ex has been saying all along is true your lawyers hopeless they only want you for the money you know this is what often the other side is saying you know they're going to bankrupt you um, and you know it's your worst nightmare isn't it when you I've supported you for years and years why should I have to support you now <laughs> mm, yeah <laughs> pretty cool. and so. yeah I mean there are those um, pretty bitter ex-partners who will say some things like you know your lawyers useless and mm. wasting your money and so on especially if the lawyers actually getting closer to the truth that seems yeah. to be kind of pulled out. It's, a, it's one of the methods of, of applying pressure, isn't it, along oh, with financial and, yeah. and mm. um, mm. conflict of yeah, children, all sorts. Um, and on a related point, those were years, so never mind the parties who were obviously going through the worst period of their lives, you were head to head with Simon Jefferson Casey, yes. who's another um, you know, brilliant um, family court uh, litigator. How, what are your tricks? For, I mean, I know Simon is a lovely guy, but what, what are your tricks for stopping it from getting personal? Because it would be really easy to, oh, you look, know? Oh, yeah. I mean, the great thing about Simon is that he has a um, fantastic sense of humour. Um, not that it is appropriate to be cracking jokes um, <laughs> around clients, and we would never do that. But, no. Um, you, you, you can't let it get personal. Mm. It's got to stay professional. You're not serving your client. Uh, you're not you? serving yeah. your client, mm -hmm. and everyone's got a job to do, and they do that job um, to the best of their ability. Mm -hmm. And you can't delve into a personal mm -hmm. can't, rabbit warren be awful. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And actually, being collegial with your colleagues makes the job manageable. Um, mm. People are, are being derogatory or nasty or mm. um, unprofessional. It just makes the whole thing mm. torrid and yeah. unpleasant. And Hard we, we have a job to do. It's within the bounds of the um, case law and the statute uh, and we've got a very clean line of obligation to our client. We've got to both stick with that and 
get on with it. Mm. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Um, so to a more general one, when I um, when, you're, when you're reading the Family Proceedings Act um, and the various sections, it looks like uh, all of the law is there. You can get pretty inspired and you think, oh, mm. you know, that is a, you know, wow. Uh, but do you think the Family Proceedings Act is actually living up to its aspirations in practice? Well, it is if you use it. And that was the whole point of Penn and McQueen was really saying, look, it's here. It, and B&M was the first case to recognise that it hadn't been interpreted as it should have been. And then, of course, the amendments came in. Mm. Um, so the, the statute itself was being very narrowly, conservatively mm. interpreted, yeah. and needlessly so, and that was kind of one of the points that when, was mm. made yeah. correctly in Pen and McQueen. Yeah. But, but its predecessor was B&M, um, which wasn't about maintenance, but there was a whole sort of raft of open comments about how it really hasn't been um, interpreted correctly, right. and that was we were able to lean on that in Pen mm. and McQueen. Mm. So the statute itself, yeah. Um, isn't uh, mean spirited, but some of the interpretations <laughs> yeah. of it, pr not so much now. But back in yeah. the Pen and McQueen days, yeah. were were kind of pretty woeful. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. And I guess you know one thing that will put people off applying or may do is what um, I think in some cases still currently, but maybe I'd be interested in what you have to say about that to get through it. So sometimes um, I think it can feel. Uh, a bit like a 1980s rape case, in you know, in there, um, and that's you know may seem a bit over dramatic, but you know, you, you're watching your client be cross-examined, um, uh, all the bank statements, and you know, pretty thoroughly sort of humiliated, um, I guess, feeling like they're begging, they should be, you know, um, and I know that. Uh, Judges are now making pretty decent awards and they're including legal costs and I think you can see that those levers are going to, you know, work. But um, what people have to do to get their silver time and the costs and the humiliation, it is outrageous really in some cases. And I wonder if you've got any thoughts on what needs to be done, what could still be done um, to change that mm. state of affairs. Well, I mean, the Law Commission's all over this, like right. a rash. Uh, and so they recommendations for um, FISAs, family income sharing arrangements mm. post-separation, sort of have a default mechanism and there's ways to get out of it, but um, that really, that would last for about five years. So mm. there's an expectation of sharing income for five years. So that it's That's not that sort of... It's also rolling in the, your current Section 15 entitlements, mm, isn't it? It is, though. Yeah. That's the trouble. So you're giving so away... That's, yeah, the Section 15 or economic disparity awards um, would be all rolled into the spousal maintenance awards. I mean there is uh, definitely an intersection between spousal maintenance and section 15 and you can't sort of double dip, you mm. can't get a compensation mm. under section 15 which doesn't take into account for example yeah, maintenance one, one offsets, yeah. But the FISA which has been recommended is um, quite a good approach because it wouldn't see the sort of undignified mm. begging, as yeah. you say. I, mm. I mean, Linda Coons and I did a paper yeah. about maintenance court. It's, it's not, about not about begging. Yeah, I showed that yeah. to my client on the morning of it. Mm. Yeah, because that and was exactly how she felt. And it can get a bit unedifying sometimes. Mm. And, and yes, it is humiliating mm. in some ways. That recommendation from the Law Commission is would move away yeah. from that. Yeah. I, I welcome that. More like that child it's support on hold sort of right now, isn't it? It is at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are some things I'm not ago. that keen on, and, yeah. and I'll, I'm happy to talk about those things under the Property Relationships mm. Act um, issue later. Mm. But yeah, it's a. But that, that, that is a, about, I think yeah. that's a very sensible thing. It destigmatizes sort of thing. it. If you mm. meet certain criteria, then mm. relief is automatic. Well, it's kind, kind of, of like child support too, which is look at. You just go straight to IRD, bang, yeah. you're entitled to it. It takes away that conflict that's collected yeah. by IRD. Yeah, yeah, I wondered about something, a bit of an algorithm, but... Mm. 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 Okay, and do you think lawyers could be doing more? Yeah, that's really interesting throughout the country. Um, I'm not sure that spousal maintenance is sought quite as much. Maybe incomes aren't as high? That's what well, yes. As um, yeah, it could be that. Um, and amongst the older generation, I think there's been a kind of view 
that spells and maintenance is a bit of icing on the cake that you don't ne necessarily need to be mm, asking throw for. throw it in at the end of the letter yeah. just to round out. The I think that's mm. changing though. And yeah. By and large, um, practitioners are really aware of people's maintenance mm. yeah. entitlements. But, you know, traditionally there was a bit of an aversion to it. Mm. Mm. South I of wonder whether that, and also that it's caught up in that concept of alimony in the states, where mm. you're asking for yeah. a big amount of money. Well, and we're so pretty well more. wedded to that clean yeah. break principle. Yeah. I don't, I don't remember when that came out, but you know, it's kind of swelled to bigger than its. Well, it's interesting that clean break principle. Mm. Um, there was a lovely decision of Justice Rodney Her uh, Hanson which said, you know, the clean break principle was never meant to be used as a tool of mm. oppression, effectively, mm. I'm paraphrasing him, but yeah. the, the clean break principle does not appear in no. either the Property Relationships Act or the Family Proceedings Act. No. It's just been a concept mm. that has been um, utilised in a principle that's, that's been created upon. by judges. Mm. And it sounds um, all very fair, but the trouble is, that if you've had a long marriage with a long history of a division of functions, who is the clean break principle serving? Yeah. It's serving the person who's able to sort of cut the other spouse mm. loose and put them out to pasture. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Which B&M just... really acknowledged, yeah. Yeah, yeah. which Why was good. Why can't we just forget about the past and move on? What's mm. wrong with you? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, uh, it's the legacy of the yeah. relationship that one party will often be left with and mm. the other isn't. Mm. Well, it's really I interesting because a judge, John Adams, who's now retired, uh, once said to me, and I think it's really, really good advice, but he used to have a, an approach where he'd exchange maybe two items of correspondence. If it hadn't settled, file proceedings. And, and the reason for that is you yeah. can still keep corresponding, but you're, yeah. you're actually heading towards a destination, mm, whereas yeah. you can spend thousands and thousands of dollars mm. on correspondence yeah. and, and you're never going to win and you're never going to mm. and it's not it's wasted yeah it um, is, so it doesn't it? mean you can't negotiate mm. when you file proceedings yeah. you can you can do it in tandem yeah. with the proceedings mm. and often yeah. it will get people negotiating yeah. anyway because they mean business yeah and that's where i think lawyers are, it's valuable because i know when we, when you act for the non-earning spouse mm. that they're just so reluctant to do that to file because they're mm. in that position position of powerlessness that they don't actually well, want to have. And they might perceive it as a declaration of war, yeah, which, which it isn't. It's just mm. saying, I'd like the court to assist us. Yeah. If we can reach agreement as well, well, that yeah. would be yeah. lovely. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's not a declaration no. of war at all. No, no. Wow, well, yeah, it is a bit. I, I, it can I, feel I, like the, that. The personal mm. consequences mm. Of, of that, I yeah. think, can, but you know, it's going to happen anyway, and I think it's a much more efficient way to do it like that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I do think that where there really is a level playing field, there's nothing wrong with people talking to each other, and yeah. the mm. more people can talk to each other, the better, yeah. and, and that otherwise it just does feather the nest of lawyers. Yeah. But there are some circumstances where there really is a power, mm -hmm. um, you know, imbalance, imbalance yeah. and so the weaker party will feel under pressure yeah. from the stronger party and mm. I'm afraid that lawyers who separate are some of the worst culprits and they'll often t try and, you know, you're never going to get this in a month yeah. and Sundays and, and tell them, try and advise their former spouses. I've seen that happen <laughs> quite a few times. But, or, or they may just be more um, better versed in mm. commercial matters and yeah. think they have the upper hand. Yeah. But that's really unsavoury. Mm. And that's where lawyers do need to step in. Yeah, and lawyers have got that context, don't they? And they can say, actually, it's, uh, yeah, he's got this much right, but he's forgotten to mention yeah. this part, you yeah. know. And then, then people, lay people, will perceive lawyers as getting in the way mm -hmm. of their agreement. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, the reason you do need independent advice is for that very necessary yeah. component of mm. independence. Mm. Um, with the benefit of hindsight, mm. and you know, we always think about how are we going to solve this case or how can we, you know, resolve it for our clients. If you could travel back in time to 2013 and tell 2013 Viv, slip mm. something into her briefcase, um, what to do, is there anything that you and Simon could have done to circumvent, you know, obviously you didn't know it at the time, but going back now, is there anything that might have circumvented that those years of? Mm. Well, I mean, Simon and I, um, you know, I can't, obviously can't um, 
get into details of that yeah. case, but mm. when we have cases against each other, and as he's reminded me, we have them against each other far too often. <laughs> uh, but we, we, we as practitioners, always try and settle things yeah. if we yeah. can. Okay, yeah. and if they're, if they're not going to settle, that's fine. We just off we go. Mm. Um, I don't think that case was ever going to be settleable, mm. unfortunately. Mm. And as I say, it was actually off the bell curve. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. it wasn't. It wasn't your run it of the mill case. case. No, yeah. and it, m most of us who've been doing this work for any length of time realise that. It, the client gets a so much better result if they can negotiate a settlement that's within a range of what the court might mm -hmm. do because there's so much uncertainty in going to court. Mm -hmm. How the witnesses might, whether they come up to brief, what ha what happens with the cross-examination. It might go well, it might go badly for them or for the other party. Um, a judge might have a particular view, form of view early on and they might have their own ideas about these things and, mm. and there's a lot of randomness that you, mm. you know, that contributes to litigation risk, mm. um, but That's then you depressing. can't <laughs> you, you can't settle everything, and yeah. you've just sometimes just got to yeah. um, go with your and, and at least when you, if you have no choice, you have no choice, and yeah, yeah. do your best. Get to make some great law. Yeah. That's a very good question. That's mm. a very good question. Mm, no. mm. Um, okay, so quick fire question time. Shelley is gonna do so you this. Got, one. We've got ten questions. You've got ten seconds, pretty much. Mm -hmm. So we're not timing you, but oh, quick don't answer. Worry about you ready? Answer. Okay. Can you do uh, DIY. DIY? Can you DIY your own spells or maintenance application? Well, you can technically. Yeah. You might not do a very good job of it, but you can. <laughs> okay. Good. How long does it take between applying to the court and getting an outcome for spousal maintenance? You should get an interim hearing date really within about three months of filing your application mm. and serving it. That's pretty, yeah. pretty mm. darn good, isn't mm. it? Do you have a favourite uh, outfit that you wear to court? Ooh, um, I have got a purple jacket that I rather <laughs> like. <laughs> That's yeah. very casey, mm -hmm. isn't it? <laughs> Is Think it? of it later. Like <laughs> just a great colour. <laughs> Is it, is it worth applying for spousal maintenance, do you think? It is now that you can factor in legal costs. And yeah. Yes, it, it takes a while, it takes a few months for it to have been worth it, but then yeah. it is, yes. Great, okay. What's the highest maintenance award that you've heard of? I think you thought that that one, um, McQueen, was the biggest at that well, time. Well, that was a big mm -hmm. past maintenance, yeah. but I mean, I've got periodic maintenance awarded around about 15, 18,000 a month. Yeah. Okay. Um, they they get settled quite quickly, those cases. Yes, yeah. I can imagine, mm. yeah. Uh, especially if they're pay, paying legals in there as well. Do you have a courtroom experience that still makes your toes curl, if you think of it? Mm. Any embarrassing stories oh. that you'll admit, <laughs> toes admit that to? that I'll admit to. <laughs> um, oh, in the High Court, a certain High Court judge saying, this isn't the family court now. <laughs> Liz Crawshaw. It was kind of like um, that Shortland Street quote. Yeah, you're quote, not in Guatemala now. Not in Guatemala now, Dr. Rapati. Oh. And I almost replied, oh gosh, isn't it? Perhaps I've yeah. come to the wrong court. I, I'll head back down yeah. to Albert Street. Uh, I was a little furious. Oh. Mm. Okay, do you think there is too much pressure on male relationship property lawyers to look hot to keep up with the glamorous ladies of law? Oh no, I don't think they, <laughs> they even they notice. They seem to be making, seem to be making too much effort. Uh, no, no, not at all. Okay, uh, do you ever say my learned colleague and struggle not to sound sarcastic? Well, I never say my learned colleague oh, because wow. that is not the correct expression. Oh. I'm very particular about saying my learned friend. Oh, and I find it really offensive yeah. for other counsel to call me anything other than that. And that is the rules, that's, how, that's, that's court yeah. protocol. Um, colleague isn't the right word, it's yeah. friend, and I object um, very strongly to being called Ms Crawshaw, oh. and court Ms Crawshaw said this, and that's mm -hmm. not polite. Yeah. It's the, the polite and courteous way oh. to address your fellow counsel is to talk to, uh, about them as my mm. learned friend. And I think that language is really important. I've gone beyond my 10 no, seconds because no, it keeps no. the court decorous. It's really important, just as calling the judge your honour is really it's important. It's less personal, isn't it? That it takes is. It more it into that into the profession. Yeah. Yes. Mm, yeah. The, the courtesy is a really crucial mm. part of 
So or, not sarcastic ever. No. <laughs> no, and I do refrain from saying with respect because that of course oh, means yeah. without respect. Yeah. Yes. No, sarcasm doesn't really have a place. Yeah. I don't I don't think that it's was a, a bit great of a joke tool. Question. No, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, what makes a great lawyer, in your opinion? Uh, integrity. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, professionalism. Um, not being in the bear pit. Not punching the noses of um, people. Treating people with dignity. Yeah. Um, knowing, your, knowing your onions. Being really well versed in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and being very clear. Yeah. Don't get all messy and muddy. Be yeah. very clear about your submissions. And, Mm. Always polite. Love mm. it. Okay, what makes a great judge? You might need to be careful mm. here. <laughs> oh, I mean, the essence of a great judge is uh, open-mindedness and fairness. Mm -hmm. And that, that goes to the process as well as the result. Mm. Um, so judges really, uh, as counsel do, need to be have humility. Yeah. Um, one of the best judges... Um, I think I've ever come across was somebody who was seriously intelligent but would say I, I may have got the mm. wrong end of the stick mm. here but and, and ask this question like we just go piercing. straight to the heart <laughs> of it yeah. and, um, and he wasn't being uh, in mm. any way fake yeah. about that so yeah. it wasn't a false humility mm. yeah. so humility open-mindedness and fairness uh, yeah. and courtesy at all times you can't abuse the pulpit, you know, you mm -hmm. can't abuse your privilege. Mm -hmm. um, no bullying, thanks, would mm -hmm. do without that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, openness, I love that. It's probably not something I would have thought of. All right, so for our last section, um, it's called Best Question Ever. Yes. And uh, for you, Ms. Crawshaw, KC, that question is How do you know you're in the right job? How do I know I'm in the right job? Gosh. Um, well, sometimes I wonder whether I am. With yeah. if you're having a bad day, it's like, is there anything worse? Mm -hmm. um, but when you get a decision and you know it's right, and you know it really does fit the facts, and it it is a fair outcome, and I really think that happens most of the time mm -hmm. in my work anyway. Wow. So, um, and, and it really makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Tifa, I mean, that sounds so sort of overused as a term, yeah. but. But yeah. it really um, yeah. puts a client back in a position yeah. of, of it feeling makes a massive difference to dignified the and the outcome um, really resounds well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's why I'm in the job. And it does, it is, there's really nothing like that, is there? Yeah. 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 Especially if there's children involved and you've made a difference to children. I got a letter from a young woman who'd become a lawyer. And she said, you won't remember me, but years ago you acted for me when I, my parents were disputing matters. And um, you were the only person who listened to me at the time. Mm. My parents didn't. Were you and counsel for the child? Or no? I was. I yeah. was a lawyer for right. the child. And, and she said, and because you listened to me, I realised that being a lawyer was a really powerful job, mm. and that's why I've gone into law. Oh, wow. Yeah, that, that it was is amazing. Gold. That it was gold. Beautiful. It was the most yeah. amazing thing I've yeah. ever received. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Awesome. That's very cool. Okay, so uh, that is brings us to the end of the podcast. If you uh, have enjoyed this podcast or learned something, check out some of the other podcasts. Um, we've got uh, a link to some materials if you want more detail um, and some interesting articles along with the link to this talk. Um, yeah, if you enjoyed it, uh, you can let people know. And if you didn't, just watch another one. See how you go. <laughs> um, <to> yourself. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, this was Divorce Cafe. Thank you so much, Viv. That was Thank really you. Um, welcome, yeah, man. instructive, insightful. And um, yeah, I've definitely got some things to take away from that for my yeah. own practice. So thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much for asking yeah. me to come along. No, that was a that was always a given. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks.